basically how do we collaborate in Houston and enable, you know, this pathway, right? You know, from university ideas to, you know, commercializations. You, you get some density of people doing interesting, good things. You get the right channels, and then it's a self-perpetuating virtuous cycle. So how do we study this? What's to learn? What are the lessons here? How do we try to take a scientific approach towards understanding what's working and what's not working? The harder things are to think about, what does this do to business models? You know, clearly you can think of this and you think, there are a lot of business models that just can't survive, right? Which ones are they? People wouldn't have even really talked about that. Business schools were more focused on training people to go work for other people. Or why do you think that that happened a little more organically at places like Stanford versus here in Houston? Welcome to Forging the Future. And a successful ecosystem is built from many collaborators, but one of the most important collaborators is universities. And Rice University has one of the top business schools in the country. So I'm very excited to be talking with Peter Rodriguez, the Dean of the Jones School of Business at Rice University. So thanks for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Chris. Really appreciate it. It's the number one, uh, one of the top business schools, and it has the number one entrepreneurship um, school in the country, right? Absolutely. For We've like been the- number one, you know, by number of rankings for at least five years in a row in graduate entrepreneurship. No matter how you measure it, we're one of the tops there. It really leverages a strength it's been building for over 20 years. But, but the whole of the graduate school is really, really strong. And now we have an undergraduate business school as well. So, Rice is really, uh, you know, at the top of our game and at the top of our peer set. We're happy about it. It's very exciting to have that here in Houston. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you are a native Texan. Absolutely, yeah. Those I was are bo- kind of rare sometimes, you know. Uh, it's funny to say that, but in Houston, <laughs> that's kind of true. Um, so I was born in, in Bryan College Station. My dad was uh, an Aggie, and he went to undergrad and grad there. I was raised in Kilgore, Texas, which is a small oil town northeast Texas. Came back. Um I did. Uh, I worked at J.P. Morgan Chase in in downtown Houston in the early '90s in oil and gas lending. And I really, you know, downtown was different then. All these things that are generational it was definitely Enron heyday. All that stuff. Uh, went to Princeton for graduate school. Had a great experience. Loved the idea of being a professor. Spent most of my career at UVA, and then in 2016 came back to Houston and Rice. Why did you come back? You know, it's a good question. So, well, I um, we're happy to have you. So back. there are a lot of great things, right? How can you not love Houston? But um, I'll put it this way: I had lived in in Charlottesville, Virginia, for 13 years. For my kids, it was kind of home. I never really expected to leave. If you're a college professor, it's about as good a college town as you can end up in. It's a great place to raise a family. But Rice was about the first. I'd say it's the first job headhunting call I got, where I picked up the phone and I thought. Yep, I want that job. I'm willing to pick up and move for that. And it was because, one, I, I did really like Houston. I always liked the city. I liked what it stood for. And I thought, these are great foundations for a business school. And I think I know that more than other people because I live there. So it's um, super diverse, global, full of energy. It's a very, very pro-business city. And then you have Rice, which is... A very strong school, great reputation, great resources. It's kind of hard to put together. And and I thought there was room on the upside. Just like every other university around here in Texas and in Houston, you can ask the folks at UH2, there's a lot of upside here. So I was excited to come back and do that and I jumped at the chance. So, and that was for the position of dean at the business school? It was, yeah. All right. So you've been doing that for six years now. This is my eighth year, actually. So I finished seven. I came in summer of 16 Time flies. I did my math wrong, but yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think with uh, 2020, 2021, I'll put 2022 and 2023 in there. It's like some of those years I want to forget. That's the blurriest period of my life. I can't, I can't date things that happened in that period very well. I'm the exact same. I can just do pre-COVID, post-COVID. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, besides, I mean, I know a lot about the entrepreneurship school. Um, what else is at a business school? I mean, just maybe briefly, I mean, sure. what is the business school do. So, you know, it's easy to think about uh, the two sides of the mission. There's one is the academic program and one of the ser- is the research. So, of course, we do both those things. We have a very big MBA portfolio, Master's of Business Administration. 
You can get our degree. Actually, we're the largest provider of MBAs in the state of Texas, which is surprising. I think people don't know that. Because it's not a big school, really. It's not a big school. And that's always a, a thing for Rice because for a business school, you have this tension of what's the right size for Rice University? And then you have what's the right size for Houston and Texas at a minimum. And, and one is giant and the other is small. So we grew in a couple of ways. You can get a full-time MBA, which is the traditional, you quit work and you go to school for two years, internship in the middle. You have a degree on the evening, uh, a degree on the weekend. You have another degree once a month. That's a hybrid MBA. You have another degree for executive MBAs, which is an average age of about 42. We have an online MBA, master's of accounting, PhD programs, and an undergraduate business component as well. So you can be an undergraduate major finance or business, or sorry, finance or management concentration. And we have an entrepreneurship minor as well, which I think will probably be a major someday too. So all those programs, um, and we direct the entrepreneurship centers at Rice. And so the the Lou Idea Lab for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which is really delivering the curricula to our students and convening all the great entrepreneurs, VCs, and other founders in town. The Rice Alliance for Technology and Entrepreneurship, which does uh, a lot of work internal for students, but a lot of work outside too, including, you know, what they're best known for is the Rice Business Plan Competition, which you know well, and it's the world's you know largest uh, school-based business plan competition, which is amazing. But clean tech and uh, accelerators, we do Red Labs, we do AlSpark, that's together, and then Blue Launch and Red Launch go together. Tons of stuff. Were entrepreneurship programs really a thing? Uh, before just like the last 10 years? Because when I went to college, yeah. I would yeah. have loved to go to an oh, entrepreneurship sure. kind of school, a minor, a major, <laughs> yeah. whatever, but it, it, there really wasn't an option. They weren't. You're absolutely right. You might have been, somebody would have been um, an engineer, let's say, or maybe they were in business. People wouldn't have even really talked about that. Business schools were more focused on training people to go work for other people, right? So you became a consultant or a banker, or maybe you went to work in a corporation. At Rice, a little over 20 years ago, a couple of professors who had their own businesses decided to kind of start talking about this in a more open way. And they really copied something like, like I think they had the Moot Court at UT Austin, and they really copied this idea of a business plan competition. And I want to say the first prizes were things like gift certificates, you know, lunch. Um, but it got a following and, and Houston's always been a city, I think that likes risk takers. And so there are students around here who thought, yeah, that's actually what I want to do. I want to work for myself or I want to try something. And in the beginning, I think it was everything from pick your industry or maybe I'm going to try to buy out, uh, you know, a, a family operation and make it a little bit bigger, a little bit better. And today, you know, it's it's the full spectrum of maybe you want to think about software as a service, maybe you want to think about hard tech, something in energy transition, healthcare innovation. It's thrilling, but it, it grew from those roots um, 20 plus years ago on a couple of professors. Interesting. And then with U of H having the number one undergrad program for entrepreneurship, it's just really interesting that both of these things happen in Houston. It is really interesting. I don't think people know that enough. So UH has been number one in undergraduate entrepreneurship through the Wolf Center and other things for at least five years. Um, and they have a fantastic program, keeps getting better. A lot of that is, you know, I don't quite know their origin story. I wouldn't, ima I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't similar, you know, that you had local folks saying, you know what we should really be focused on and drawing the business schools that way. But I do think Houston just likes that idea of make it on your own, go for it, uh, make a difference. And it's a business first city in my way of thinking. You know, I, I don't think that other places have that. And that's one of those strategic foundations I was really attracted to coming back to. Was that a piece of it? That, that was definitely a piece of it. If you think about it, so think about, so if you're Chicago, University of Chicago or Northwestern, you, you've got a big global city there. They're a little more corporate based than we are. Uh, same for New York. You have Columbia and NYU, Boston, you have MIT and Harvard. Those are great cities. They've got giant corporations, but I don't know that they're sort of business friendly and business first in the way that Houston is, and even in the way that Texas is just really wide open. So that attitude helps a lot. And when I was in Virginia, I think you know my only deficit I could think of there was, this is a great school, but it's not exactly surrounded by a lot of 
businesses and founders and and VCs and other folks that can just walk in and be a part of the business school on a daily basis. But here you have that. Hmm. And your background is economics, right? Yeah, I loved economics. I really studied globalization and international trade. Dissertation was really thinking about NAFTA and what would happen if China grew and India grew and all these things that have happened now. Um, but I love that idea of thinking about the system and the economy that way. Um, I didn't imagine that I would necessarily be in a business school while I was doing that, but the combination of having been a banker in Houston and then having that econ background meant that the right place for me in academia was a business school because you sort of have a foot in two places. You know, you're really connected to the business community and what people are really doing on a daily basis, the problem sets they're working on. And then you're you're thinking about academics. So how do we study this? What's to learn? What are the lessons here? How do we try to take a scientific approach towards understanding what's working and what's not working? Perfect fit for me. Really love that. So thinking about the last few years in the economy, I mean, we're all in new territory, right? Yeah, you sort of toss out the script. Yeah. Um, I would say, so let's, let's go to COVID. I don't think anybody had that on their plan or even their economic management plan. The economy has been resilient and we've had lots of changes. China really cooling and changing things a lot. Energy transition, throwing a lot of opportunity into the system, but also lots of uncertainty AI is, um, you know, a giant question mark. I think I'm super optimistic about what its impact will be on productivity, but with regard to the direction, who knows? I mean, we, these are these discussions, you know, I remember my first dial up modem and it was hard to envision, you know, social media at that time or things we have today, but that was sort of the course of things. And, and you wouldn't have, I wouldn't have guessed Google Chrome over Netscape. I wouldn't have guessed well, I wouldn't have guessed anybody over Nokia or BlackBerry either, but all these things um, have developed and, and AI is brand new. We're, we're working hard to do well by our students and the ways that we incorporate and teach that, but it's, it's open. I'm, I'm optimistic, but it's a really different place. And then there's lots of global uncertainty, you know, what's happening in Israel, what's happening in Ukraine. My gosh, inflation was a giant, um, a new thing, you know, I think, yeah, I, I, I remember it vaguely, you know, from my my time in middle school, I guess, you know, sort of remember that sort of period of my parents getting really angsty about gas prices. But uh, it'd been a while, but it came back pretty hard. How did that affect really the curriculum or what you're teaching these business students and these MBAs and these entrepreneurs of how to run a business when the sand is shifting under their feet so dramatically? Uh, yeah. Did you have to incorporate something new into those courses or? We sort of did a little bit of two things. So on the one hand, I'll tell you that most professors will say, we talk about those things, but students hear them differently in the right context. So when you're talking about high interest rates or inflation, and it's, I don't know, 2017, eh, students don't quite perk up for that part of the lesson so much. Um, but in a period of change, suddenly their ears uh, open and, and you get a chance to make an emphasis on those points. So we both redirect the curricula a little bit. Um, and then with respect to AI, you know, it's it's trying to build it in quickly. I, I think the experience was one year ago, maybe even just 11 months ago, people on the inside of the universities were saying, we've got to stop this for now. We can't deal with it. It's too fast. And we're worried about how we manage the integrity of our courses. By about late spring, most of them were saying, okay, we've got to steer into the skid, bring it in. And I've got a few ideas. And so we did launch a few new courses this fall and we'll launch a few in the spring that make better use of it, uh, that try to incorporate it. I think some of the simple things that are obvious to a lot of people we used to teach a little more programming. I think we're learning how to do that a little bit better or how to give people who don't have much depth in programming a bit more capability because they can use natural language to get around some of the, the things that we would do in a business course and see it in computer science and other areas. They might take a slightly different approach, but that's one. The harder things are to think about, what does this do to business models? You know, Clearly, you can think of this and you think, so... There are a lot of business models that just can't survive, right? Which ones are they? That's harder, and that takes you back 
to thinking about fundamentals of strategy, thinking about cost issues, dealing with change. You know, how do we actually do that? You know, one approach is look at a dozen radical models. One of them will end up being right. Eleven will be wrong. That will probably happen. But getting people ready for that is is something they have to experience. And so um, it's exciting, I have to say. You know, professors can always take that uh, circumspect view. I'm sure there'll be a lot of turmoil, but we kind of get to watch as we always do. And it's exciting. I'm, I'm excited about what's coming. Yeah, me too. I think it's going to be a really interesting five or 10 years here coming up as we oh, see yeah. the impact. And yeah. what's different, I think, with AI is that when the internet was coming along, no one really knew what it was about or how it was mm-hmm. going to work. And there was geeks like us that knew more about yeah. it and were more excited. But yeah. most people are like, what, yeah. dot com, what? Who cares, yeah, yeah. right? You know? Or it'll never catch on. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what, and modems and dial up, what's yeah, going yeah, on? Yeah. Uh, but with AI, it's like an immediate. It's immediately useful. I mean, now, right? right and of course, right. they've been working on it for since I was in business forty years ago. But mm-hmm. I, the Gen AI and the AI models, and you can you don't have to know how to program. You don't have to be a Python developer. You don't have to get your LLM set yeah. up. You don't have to do anything except know English and how yeah. to ask the question. Yeah. And that's pretty fascinating. And if you're not using it now in your business for a lot of different things, you're actually uh, behind already because you can use it for reviewing your mm-hmm. documents and your legal work and doing research and job postings and whatever else. I mean, it's actually useful. To, I mean, you have to kind of, you know, obviously just like GPS will get you there. Right. Not maybe the most efficient way and there's some right. cleanup, right, but right. I mean, with AI, you can really leverage it now. And if if you're not trying to figure that out, um, I think you're, you're already behind the curve and you need to hurry up. Um, so I think it's going to be pretty fascinating. Well, I, I will just add to that. We had, and, and I'm not an expert in any way, but I moderated a conversation with a number of Houston companies in the Woodlands about a month ago. Uh, and everything from the National Bureau of Shipping, who said, you know, we're taking pictures of ship hulls and we're using AI to sort of evaluate in a way that we used to have experts evaluate. And AI does a more consistent, objective job that's improving safety. And it's like immediate, you know, the time lag is nothing. But all of them were racing to try to to do this. And and I get it. You know, the race is definitely on. And that's a really productive pressure. So I I can only imagine what even the next year is going to bring. It's it's pretty exciting. So speaking of AI, which yeah. is very innovative technology, maybe talk a little bit about the university's approach to innovation and how that's evolving here in Houston. Well, I, it, it's evolving in the last couple of years and a way I'm excited about. So Rice has always been like lots of universities, excited about discovery. You know, and sometimes you'll ask people, why do you study this or why do you research this with millions and tens of millions of dollars of grants? And a very honest answer from a lot of scientists is, I'm just curious about it. I want to understand it to understand it. And so that tends to be an end in and of itself. But increasingly, that money and the benefits universities want to receive, but also promulgate in the uh, community is commercialization of these really great ideas. So what is the next step, which is incredibly hard, but we've seen great examples from schools like MIT or Cal Berkeley or Stanford. It's completely changed those universities. It's brought them so much more power to study big ideas, and it's made them central to not only their regional economies, but globally. And Rice really wants to be more active in that way. So we've invested more at preparing the university to extend its reach from discovery and even refining application to commercialization of ideas. And that's at least two things. It's the science that you do first, but it's the entire commercialization process. And that's where a marriage of what the business schools can do and can at least help do and what they do to connect to you know the local community and the scientists and engineers and biologists and uh, all the litany of other professors there do well. So we're leaning heavy into this. The ION is a piece of that story. That's a big connection piece to the rest of Houston and a convening point for lots of people who, you know, we'd like to have spend more time in and around the university, but don't always. Uh, and then what we're doing in the business school is trying to make sure that we turn inward enough too so that we can support those scientists and engineers as they're developing and, and try to set up commercialization channels, at least Uh, take them to the outskirts of the area where the private sector is ready to take over and do more. So that's our big effort. 
trying to enable that. Is that uh, some of what Paul Tricurry is doing there? That's what Paul is squarely doing. So his job uh, was invented to help build this channel out a little bit further. And so it's things like, it might start for us with what we might call a lab day, where you go to the different labs and you have, I would call them lay people, they're business people like the ones that we have. And they're going to listen and learn a little bit about what each lab is doing. It helps to have people who have capability in that space. So it's great if you have an engineer or a scientist who maybe they didn't get a PhD or maybe they haven't spent their life researching, but they can appreciate the significance of what's being done. And they make sort of the first cut. This is an idea we might want to think more about, and here's the next step towards that. Um, and then Paul's group or you know Paul's efforts are going to pick up and pull that forward to try to commercialize more. And that makes good sense for Rice. It also helps us live a bit of our strategy. We're really focusing in my school and in the engineering school on advancing the energy transition and decarbonization efforts. So there's a lot of that to do here. We'll do more in healthcare and in other spaces too. We'd like to be better and deeper in tech in general. I think we're made a lot of headway in Houston there. We have HPE and others around who do some big things. And yeah, it's exciting for us. But that's a that's a new that's a new skill set for us. Yeah, I would like to try to explore, I think, uh, trying to connect that with like what we're doing in the mm -hmm. venture studio, mm -hmm. right? So we have a cohort of companies mm -hmm. and startups. And if the universities are trying to get technology out and into commercial applications, actually right. bringing, you know, some of those into like a studio program for a while that's, yeah. that is very like startup focused, you know, might be one idea. So um, I think at some point I want to circle back with, with Paul and ask him what he's what he's doing or maybe what, you know, basically how do we collaborate in Houston and enable, you know, this pathway, right. You know, from university ideas to, you know, commercializations. We had, uh, we had Trevor Best here from CZ oh, yeah. Um yeah. which I think was technology out of rice. It right? was. And that mm -hmm. was uh, a research labs idea with uh, professor Naomi Hallis and at least mm -hmm. a couple of others. And there's, I'm sure, lots of ideas like that going on, uh, like the gold mine of <laughs> those types of things in the university, right? That's what we think. You know, mm -hmm. we think well, there's a lot of that and we want to do better at it. But connections to soft tech and others would make a lot of sense for us because more than anything else, you know, we just need to be more attractive to the world of entrepreneurs and to all the people who want to come and do this because we understand that's how it works. You know, um, you, you get some density of people doing interesting, good things you get the right channels, and then it's a self-perpetuating virtuous cycle. Um, so we want to get bigger and better to do that. And I see momentum, but we want to keep it up. Or why do you think that that happened a little more organically at places like Stanford versus here in Houston? Because we're having to be deliberate here. Yeah. Where there, it was just, it just kind of happened, you know? Yeah, no, that, that's kind of the... Uh, the the magic uh, that is hard to explain and everybody tries to know that. And we study those all the time. People will point to things like, well, there was this pivotal investment in a lab that was designed to fill in the blank, right? It might've been, you know, uh, war armaments or it might've been something else, but we've had space and we've had medicine and other things. I, I, I think that some of it is luck for sure. And some of it is, you know, when we look inward, we say some of it is a university push. I think Rice... Um, probably wasn't exactly of the scale it needed to be early. I think UH probably wasn't exactly in the areas it needed to be early. And so that piece was certainly something that should have been a little bit better than it was. The other pieces people point to a lot is, you know, we sort of have a, a big industry and is it possible to really have more than one or, or can you have, so like saying, can you really, can a brand really have two identities and can Houston really be more than than energy or, you know, can we do other things besides that? But but we certainly think that scale would matter and intentionality from universities would do more. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that we can help deliver more of that in the future. I think you're right. I mean, the luck component, if people say that, uh, that luck wasn't involved in their success, oh, yeah. you know, they, they're not really, they don't really understand uh, what happened. And so sometimes you do need to have that lightning strike at the right time. Um, sometimes it happens at the wrong time, but you know, you can point to any successful company, whether that's Google to, mm -hmm. you know, SpaceX to Tesla, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, there were times that they were, you know, about to go out of business. Right? Oh, yeah. And so certain things happened and then, you know, things took off. 
Uh, and so... Yeah, it's easy to tell the story the other way. Mm-hmm. And you, it sort of makes perfect sense. When you, when you run the tape back, you think, well, it was destined to be true. Absolutely not. You know, you can pick winners uh, all the time in reverse, but going forward, nobody can. That's just a... And, and that's a hard pill to swallow, I think, for a lot of entrepreneurs. But they, that's what they sign up for, too. Well, you talked about the importance of getting out from the university and commercializing mm-hmm. and getting some of that gold mine out into mm-hmm. um, startups. And the Rice Business Plan competition is one way to do that. Right. right? And that's actually bringing in uh, universities worldwide. Oh, yeah. Right? Well, we have – you think of it as an NCAA tournament. You started at least 64 – we could go to 128. It's hard to even get in the competition, but um, universities around the world and, you know, typically the the A list of all the universities here, we always have competitors from Harvard, Stanford, MIT, you name it. Um, they, they brought some of their best technologies here. We're known to be uh, on the path. They all have to come through and you've seen the competition. You get some really great, interesting ideas and even the ones that aren't quite ready for prime time then you can sort of see uh, what's to come. So I think there've been over $8 billion of funding uh, to those companies that have come through. It's, it's an incredible success. It's impressive. Yeah. It's the largest in the world, right? As far Absolutely. as it was. Yeah. Um, but what about the opposite direction? I mean, it looks like yeah. we have the, uh, the graduate program. We have the undergraduate mm-hmm. program. I heard that there was even some programs in high school. Is that here in Houston, is that true? Is that happening, and does it need to happen? It it needs to happen more. There are a few, but you know the real talent we have in the long run is a great city full of young people. That's actually great for the economy locally. But you know the school system definitely needs to work harder. You know uh, everywhere everything from middle school up through high school to get kids ready to go to college. So we definitely need more going, more ready to succeed at a top university or at a very strong university and STEM fields in particular. I think everybody hears this. I could just reemphasize that it's true and we're not meeting uh, the bar at the moment. But just the kids make up their mind pretty early, I think is what's what's tricky. Unfortunately, a lot of them, by the time they're 17 or 18, aren't necessarily thinking about this type of an idea. They don't even envision it, right? Could I actually be an entrepreneur? When we when we hear about Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg's or Jeff Bezos's, I think a lot of kids think they're amazing, but you know there was something, you know, miraculous about them. They were born on the right side of history, and and that's not for me. But they need to know that actually, maybe not always at that level, but maybe, but actually, at, the whole world is made up of entrepreneurs that have gone out, tried these things, made some successes, had some failures, but that's available to you. And with a little bit of preparation, you can really improve your odds. There's a lot of it happening. We need to extend in that direction and we need to make sure that our uh, public schools in particular are stronger than they are right now uh, and feed more. And, and then on our end, the universities need to have more scale and more uh, more active engagement with those communities. And that's true everywhere, but it's especially true here in Houston. I think it is interesting, you know, uh I had five children and I have three grandkids. They're actually at, at the younger ages, they're they're very interested in oh. money and entrepreneurship. Yeah. This is why they do lemonade stands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lemonade day organization mm-hmm. that we actually sponsor at one of our chili showdowns and um and so there's 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 an interest there. Yeah. It's somewhere between there and like you said, high school. Yep. It, 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 the interest dies. I don't know. Why? It's like we need a little bit more of a spark. There's like junior achievement, and I, I right, was even in J J when I was a, a yeah. kid. So, but you know, it's they're very small programs, you know. Um, but if we could somehow encourage that in the middle level, um, but as far as I know, there's not really anything in high school that's targeting startup and entrepreneurship. Right? Not that much. You're right. So we we do have J A come to Rice and support them. They do a good job. They don't have the reach, I think, uh, that is needed, but, you know, they're they're on the right side of things. I think you're right. My, my hypothesis, for whatever it's worth, you know, I have one like everybody else, is that I think kids just get a little um, shy later. Or they somehow see the complexity ahead, whether it's thinking, you know, I don't know if I could be a computer scientist. That's pretty tough. Or, you know, the math for engineering uh, is a bit daunting and maybe... Maybe that's not for me. Or or maybe it's just that I don't have any money. You know, how do you actually, uh, do I need to raise 
even $100,000, how would I possibly do that? Um, and I think for some, you know, it's like a lot of things. You just get talked out of it uh, in your own head. And hearing more stories is valuable because we all know entrepreneurs who were scrappy, found a way, just kind of, you know, little by little made things up. I always tell my kids and others, I didn't really have a direction. I'm not a successful entrepreneur, but I, I kind of just did what I liked and kept going. And, you know, the world lays out some paths. If you're, if you're willing to keep your eyes open, one might appear for you that's really appealing. And that's usually how people get started. But we need that. I, on the optimistic side, I'll say, I do get, sometimes get high school kids send me a video of their pitch. And they're 16 or 17, and they got some company idea, and they'll do a quick, you know, they're, they've been watching Shark Tank. They'll do a pitch and send it in. They're like, I, will, I really want to come to Rice. This is part of my application. What do you think? So there's some really bright kids out there. We just need a lot more. Yeah, I think I saw an article not too long ago that said, you know, within the next couple of years, we're going to have like the first billionaire teenager that Crazy. has started a, because there's so many tools available online right. now and right. that you can leverage. And, you know, it's not just about being a social media influencer, but leveraging what's out there in order to build a business and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, stand up, you know, you can start up a website when you're on AWS mm -hmm. in like 10 minutes or whatever. You that's know? right. And so uh, I think that's pretty, pretty interesting. So we'll, we'll see maybe uh, entrepreneurship will shift. So how do you think Rice is forging the future? Well, lots of ways. I think we'd always do that. But the one that comes to mind sort of marries two parts of our five pillar strategy. So if we have two um, academic thrusts that we want to be differentiated from, one is entrepreneurship and the other one is accelerating the energy transition. So our business school is committed to putting those two things together. And a great example is our clean tech accelerator, which is now in its third year. We're trying our best to make sure that we bring to life new technologies through new firms that advance the energy transition and ensure that we have lots of energy in the future, whether that's wind, solar, hydrogen, cleaner forms of fossil fuels, everything that we can do. And that's an exciting piece. We're going to have to have lots of bold, adventurous entrepreneurs go out and really try hard to make that happen. And maybe that's the best way we're forging the future. And how do you become a member of the Clean Tech Accelerator? Well, you compete like everything else. And so you can apply uh, through the Rice Alliance for Technology and Entrepreneurship. Contact us at Rice. And uh, there's an application process and you get vetted. And we use our community of entrepreneurs and other people in energy and in um, and who've been founders. And they vet the firms. And we put together cohorts. And uh, you could be a part of the next great cohort. And that's and it's open to anybody. You don't have to be a Rice student or something. You just have to have an idea. Okay. And so it's open to absolutely everybody. All right. Well, we'll make sure that link is on the, uh, the episode. We can do that. Well, this is super interesting, Peter. Thanks for coming and sharing uh, your insights. I uh, love what you're doing at Rice. I think it's super important. Um, and I, I like to hear how you're building out the rest of the, the pipeline and ecosystem. And... Uh, I've got some socks for you. Oh, man. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. And thanks for having me. We oh, need to sure, see you more. Right? That's great. So I have my I have my owl socks on. Oh, there you and go. So they're so great, but this looks like... We have some economists. Um, oh, my gosh. Now, listen, <laughs> as an economist, this is really going to be me. Oh, I can point to this. Oh, and this is, you know, a bit of my portfolio and some some big misses, too. It but might not the, be a real-time number there, but... Uh. <laughs> that's all right. I see a lot of the ones here that I'm a big fan of. So nice. thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate well, it. Well, thanks for being on.